I am so, so excited and so honored to have with me these incredible educators and scholars to Latinx TV in the 21st century with me here, Carlos Gabriel Kelly Gonzalez, a PhD student in the Department of English at The Ohio State University, specializing in Latinx studies and video game studies. He's published widely in the areas of Latinx cultural studies and video game studies, as well as a published, very accomplished poet. His chapter disidentifies the bandido figure in The Mandalorian. He combines the, the approach of the disidentification with his concept of the performance of Mando to show how the Mandalorian at once uses and abuses, deforms sci-fi and in the use of tropes of the Western, unpacking how it at once inhabits the bandido and resists and challenges it. Irma Zamora uh, Fuerte is a PhD candidate at the Ohio State University, researching and publishing on Latinx representation in children. Uh, I mean, in undocu uh, social media, narratives, literature, uh, Irma's chapter focuses on the televisual representation of undaca minted immigrant narratives in the shows Jane the Virgin, On My Block, and Party of Five, focusing on the protagonists of these shows on particular characters in these shows and the arcs that are constructed that showcase differences in gender and nationality that come with their respective immigrant status and experience. Welcome, Carlos and Irma. Hi. Hello, what's happening? So tell me, let's start with uh, Carlos. Let's, how did you get into this? Like doing this, what, like the re this research on Latinx TV media, um, uh, and and then finally the writing of this particular chapter. Uh, sure. Uh, more broadly, Latinx TV and media. I love seeing, or writing about and exploring how we're represented in TV and film and video games. You know, anything when it comes to when it comes to televisual media. Uh, I'm all about it, and. and we, we get so little representation to begin with. So I really, instead of being just satisfied with what we get, kind of taking it under a, a lens, if you will, or a microscope to, to see, you know, what's productive and what's just uh, reproducing the status quo, if you will. Mm. Um, when it comes to The Mandalorian specifically, like I was just at that time, I had, I've always been interested in Westerns. At that time, I was like binging all things Western. And that included, you know, a couple series, uh, The Good, Bad, The Ugly, uh, playing Red Dead Redemption 2, and, and just, you know, uh, Westworld. In all these, you know, we don't really see Latinxes. Uh, if we do, they're all stereotypes, right? I mean, even, even Westworld, right? 21st century production. Uh, with huge budgets from HBO, yet they can't envision us beyond uh, Bandido. And I don't really know what the other guy, I mean, I guess you could call him the white man's servant. I don't know, whatever you want to call him, right? But he's definitely not uh, portrayed in positive ways or that sort of speak to his complexity or either their complexity of those two characters. Um, so I started just thinking about science fiction and the western and through westworld and i started thinking about the mandalorian and i was just like i kept coming back to the idea of mando like yo mando quien manda you know and and i just couldn't get away from that right and i was like dude they're literally calling mando mando is mando you know i don't know i can't think of any other way <laughs> like you know, when they think, when they name him, they're naming him in the way that points back to Spanish language and, and the concept or the question of like, ¿Quién manda aquí? You know, <laughs> something probably our parents, all, all our parents have said to us before. And so I really try to see that as a window into challenging who gets to call the shots in Star Wars, um, especially when it comes to Latinidad. Uh, I argue, I mean, pretty point blank that I don't think Latinx exists in Star Wars. Uh, 
sure there are actors who play roles, but there's no such thing as Latinidad in Star Wars. You know, there's no language, even though there are all these other languages like Jawis and Ha'is and, mm. uh, you know, other ways of imagining how people in space speak. But somehow we always come back to English. English is cool. Everybody speaks English. It's universal, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, there are instances going that can go into language that I think that Star Wars can delve into more. Uh, but really, it's just about challenging this, this notion of men being in charge in Star Wars. Mm -hmm. um, because that's the major representations that we get as Latinx is uh, Star Wars is through men. Uh, there have been a few women, a few Latinas in Star Wars, but uh, almost always hidden uh, away uh, as an Ewok or as, you mm -hmm. know, uh, Padme's uh, double as a queen, mm -hmm. right? So we don't even, they're not even in the picture uh, until uh, Rosario Dawson and Ahsoka Tano, which I'm pretty excited about, but, you know, that comes, that's still to be released. So I really mm -hmm. try to think about, you know, can we expand who calls the shots? In Star Wars, and somehow can we, uh, instead of you know, uh, including Latin Nexus without Latinidad, is there some way for Star Wars to imagine a world where you know Latin Nexus are you know there and mm -hmm. with, through our infrastructure, through our architecture, designs, etc., whatever countries inspire those? But that's sort of where the journey began. It's a long answer, but that's you know, I was just ruminating on Mando and you know, who gets to call the shots. Mm, I love that. I love it. I love, uh, absolutely love it. And I also love like the, the idea of like performing Mondo, right? Um, but we'll get, we'll, we'll loop back to that one. Irma, let's, let's talk about your journey. Like, you know, your, you know, why Latinx TV? And then finally, why, you know, the, the particular focus that you bring to your chapter? Yes, of course. Um, I think Latinx TV in particular, um it's really taken a course again uh, i think you said La Torre mentioned that how or a lot of people have mentioned that uh popular culture sort of is uh aligned with like the discourse that is said about folks and how it really controls our imagination of who is like the people what they are and really di dictates how we approach them so i think really going into tv and seeing how uh, certain discourses get played out in the media about people and shaping how uh, others are being read or reading us, right? So um, Latinx in particular was, or TV in particular was just kind of a way it's very serialized. I I watched a lot of TV growing up, like telenovelas is a big thing. Jane the Virgin is very much stemmed in, in that telenovela uh, kind of structure. So I think it was, I was already watching that beforehand. And I think understanding how these really lived experiences of um, undocumented folks is playing out. It's really um, like ingrained in, into a lot of the community conversations with Latinidad um, really led me to think about that, especially like in my own background in a mixed status family, thinking about how those stories are being represented um, in these three shows in particular. So mm -hmm. Jane the Virgin, um, on my block and party of five are handling the stories of undocumented uh, communities they're in individuals very differently um, as I, I write in the book and they're doing very different things but still playing to similar tropes and I think at the time when I wrote um, a lot of this that the paper uh, the chapter uh, the discussions around the border and the Central American caravans at the in, in 2018, the child migrant crisis, they were all still very uh, prevalent on our minds. And I think really shaping the fact that um, we see people who are trying to cross the border who are in the United States as undocumented in very particular ways. Um, and, and that's being reinforced in some ways with uh, within Latinx shows, but also mm -hmm. being fought. It's like there's tensions there that we really need to be thinking about. And I didn't write this. I think I had written a lot of this, uh, maybe even done before the Haitian migrant crisis. Um, but I think that idea of like, there's folks who are presented in the mixed status families and they're all like white, very much appealing to this idea of the good moral immigrant mm -hmm. um, that are being represented on these shows that are appealing to white, like uh, 
normativity, right? So mm. we're that's very much in contrast with like, or it really plays out what's happening in at the border. The people mm. who are not being uh, allowed in are not are presented as moral or good mm. or healthy now, right? So with the COVID-19 crisis in Title 42, I think. Um, so I think how that's still being played out and um, appealed to in the shows is still affecting how we're meeting people trying to leave their situations mm -hmm. or escape from certain things in their home homelands or mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. trying to come here just to make a, a life for themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, kind of beautifully leads me to my next question, which is, you know, it sort of surprises. And for me, really, uh, Irma, you know, you putting, shining kind of a light, a spotlight on, um, yes, having this woven into stories and reconstructions of our stories, of our experiences is important, but like you point out, uh, it also reinforces, solidifies the desirable, undesirable, right? Um, narrative that is put into practice, that is, um, you know, every day, every second of the day. And it's not just, you know, Latinxes, Latino, Latinas uh, um, crossing, you know, into the US, it's also here every day, right? Um, and, you know, I was just thinking about, you know, the fact that 94 years of Oscars and we have our first, you know, queer Afro-Latina, you know, and it's like that whole desirable and undesirable kind of playing out on the stage there, right? You know, we're celebrating, but we should actually probably not be, I mean, I want to celebrate for her, for them, but I, I also want us to be mindful of the fact that we have, as you point out, a very entrenched system of colorism, even within our communities, that allow certain bodies, certain uh, subjectivities to have visibility and to be um, accepted and those and others not. Yeah, I think that very much, and I think that's what you were getting at too with your paper, Carlos, um, how we're moving sort of beyond just the representation aspect. It's, it's not just enough to see a brown body up there. We really need to think about what kind of discourses they we're all playing to, right? So I think that was one of the surprises, actually, if we keep thinking about it, um, with that I was kind of going through as I was writing the paper was just thinking about, yes, these are really great stories. I really loved Jane the Virgin when I was still in college. That was one of the shows that I would stress watch while I was preparing for finals. Um, I really loved a lot of the tropes. I think it does great things, but how do we push um, on certain narratives? They're still kind of lacking some things. How do we push a little bit more? Um, I think that's what I was finding out kind of surprising that I was going down that road as I was writing, mm. but that was one of my surprises. Beautiful. Thank you. So beautifully articulated. Uh, Carlos, did you want to follow? Sure. I think, um, I think a couple of things surprised me. And I think one of the biggest things was my, like my brain sometimes thinks in Spanish or English, right. Depending on the context, but being able to like, think about of a way of approaching texts through a span through Spanish language, right? Even though I'm writing in English, somehow, you know, fuses together the two languages in, in a way that I think really um, sort of points to my life as, as Mexican American, right? I think uh, that was surprising that I could use the term mando or, or to mandar uh, or quien manda in an English essay. So that was pretty exciting. Mm. Um, two, also just thinking about uh, sort of the, some of the historical work that I did looking at how Latinx is uh, resisted through, you know, not being protagonists, but, you know, through how they took up space or, or, or on the, in the, in the angling of the shots, right. To, I think Charles Maria Ramirez Berg does a, a great job uh, highlighting an actor, uh, 
I forget his name. I'm sorry. Uh, who who did that? Right. He wasn't he wasn't allowed to take up the space as a protagonist, but he the way he dressed, uh, the way he uh, took up space mm-hmm. on screen, uh, allowed him to capture uh, the attention of viewers and audiences. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I just think too, looking at our our deep history within science fiction and 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 westerns, and yet, you know. I guess not being able to see us as protagonists until sort of the Mandalorian, right? And and that's why I also, you know, just kind of speaking in general now, uh, I also love when Latinxes are in Star Wars because it shows us as borderless, as intergalactic, as as having the ability to to you know transgress spaces and laws and all these ways of viewing us. Uh, which is why I see so much hope and possibility in Star Wars stories involving Latinxes, um, and which is why I get so upset that they don't make more concrete efforts to include Latinx. Mm. Like it can't yeah. just be making, you know, Oscar Isaac's character a spice runner. Like why? Mm. You no, know? mm. why is it got to go back to criminality? Like I don't need that. Mm. I don't need, uh, you know, what's his name. Uh, He's like a shifty arms dealer. Uh, the names escape me. Uh, but he's a shifty arms dealer in the new prequel, um, Benicio del Toro, right? And so it's like, again, like we, we exist in ways in Star Wars that to build off Hirma's point, that reproduce and only build from the discourse that sees us as criminals, hmm. right? Like that's all. And yet we have so much to offer but this is where people see us, right? In these little boxes. And, and I think, I mean, to get to your point, Carlos, like sci-fi is this one like realm where like everything is possible, right? So why can't we be using, like pushing for more possibilities for Latinos on screen, like beyond what we are right now, escaping those uh, boxes, move away from the box as you kind of hinted it's like sci-fi should be that one place but it seems to be still going to those tropes Mm -hmm. beautiful i mean so important all everything that you've both been sharing with me let me ask you um in the classroom how do you bring these concepts how do you bring your students around to these concepts um how is latinx televisual social media kind of interrogated critiqued um, in constructive ways in your educational spaces, Irma? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think given the where I'm teaching at right now, I've mostly focused on how do we uh, really think about what TV shows or murals in particular, I think those are very visual things that students can grasp onto. How are they being used to tell stories um, that maybe expand their understandings. Like, so trying to meet them where they're at, but also get them to use those skills that they need, right? But still giving them those texts um, that are might provide them with more. I, I used the scene from Hentify on season one, episode five, the mural with the, the two queer men that are depicted. I think showing that as like an aspect of possibilities, but also tensions that exist when you expand the possibilities of representation um, I think that's been how I've used a lot of TV, just thinking about where the representations are and how we can apply our whatever technicalities we're using for the classroom, but still mm-hmm. using them to open up more um, areas of conversation with mm-hmm. our students. Mm-hmm. Carlos. Yeah, I think, um, well, this semester I taught video games again. and. We look. We looked at stories, or we looked at it. The two video games mm-hmm. we played, um, Hellblade: Sinful Sacrifice and Miles Morales, uh, through Latinx theory, right? And and so, mm-hmm. I mean, I had students, you know, uh, like Irma says, basically where we're at, right? It's a majority white students in there, right? So you got, you know, students who may have never even thought about Latinxes before now learning and wrestling and grappling with, uh, you know, Jose Esteban Munoz's disidentifications, what that mm-hmm. means and how that sort of can be a survival strategy. Yes, for Latinx is, 
but it can also be a way of broadening the the tools that students have to um, you know analyze and critique our media choices, especially in video games. Uh, one of the things too I, I, I taught and continue to to think about uh, Christopher Gonzalez's mm -hmm. permissible narratives. Um, mm -hmm. Thinking about you know what is permissible for Latinxes when it comes to TV, when it comes to our stories uh, about us. Uh, on you know and TV film and video games for me and video games um, because it's sort of what's present on my mind you know students realize that based on what was successful before dictates what can be permissible now right so Latinx early stories male centric you know former uh, gangbanger you know made it to education or you know, uh, crossing the, the border or, you know, living in Mexico because most of it's Mexico centric as well. Uh, and then crossing over, et cetera, all these narratives and the ways we're used to seeing Latinx has really built expectations around what would be authentic Latinx stories. Mm -hmm. So, and again, those are all conceptions based on white audiences, based on white publishers, based on, you know, how they see us, right? Uh, I think uh, Tropicalization is a great book to sort of think about that too. Uh, but, you know, we think about what's permissible. And so we think about uh, Miles Morales, like his story is not permissible without Peter Parker. Uh, we don't like, why do we need Peter Parker to tell Miles' story, both into, in, and into the Spider-Verse film and the two, uh, two video games where Miles Morales appears? Um, well, it's probably because Peter Parker's white, he's more recognizable, uh, he, et cetera, right? So these ways of looking at that as a sort of anchor for Latinx storytelling to permit it to be there. And, and this, this semester was really sort of eye-opening for, for students and myself to, to see them, grow, you know, taking these theories and applying it to games that, in ways that they had never thought of, right? And so now for me, it's expanding the field of video game studies from relying on Eurocentric, Anglo-centric studies uh, where, you know, based in narrative that, you know, come up with all this terminology that doesn't explore people of color's predicaments, right? So you tell, you, you think about how stories are told, but you don't think about how stories are told when and when in about, uh, you know, marginalized communities. Mm -hmm. And so this time with these, with this group of students, I seen how, uh, successful Latinx studies can be uh, as a way to theorize our conditions, you know, that it's not just about, yeah, it's, it's concerning us as Latinxes, right? But everyone should think about Latinx studies because of how it deals with border positionalities, because of how it deals with privilege and citizenship, because it deals uh, how we're talking about, you know, how male focused uh, it is when we think about TV and, and film and video games, how most of those stories are about men, you know, so having them see and question what is permissible really has been um, sort of, uh, it's really been fruitful in, in the mm -hmm. conversations that we've been having this semester. Wonderful. Well, look, um, I want to wrap this up, but my, my final wrap up question, uh, is there a TV, a Latinx TV uh, show um, or webisode or platform um, that's particularly exciting for you today. Um, I know we, we cover a lot in our volume or, and it's like an extraordinary volume, um, but it's, there's something out there now that has kind of really grabbed your attention. Um, Irma? Yeah, um, I think really Hentified has been, Hentified and Vida, which are kind of similar uh, shows, but very kind of differently positioned. Um, they are both doing very interesting things. I've seen a lot of Hentified, I finished the whole two seasons, and I think that one opens up a lot more in terms of representation, um, opens up what Latinidad can and could be, um, both on the screen and off the screen and thinking about representing queer Afro-Latinos, 
um, really thinking about that triple consciousness that's theorized within Afro-Latinidad Afro study. So um, even undocumented narratives, who gets to get their um, story told and how can they tell it? Um, there's a lot happening there within Latinidad that I think we can probably expand on at one point. Great. And Carlos, as we wrap this up. Sure. Uh, I think I agree. Hentified was amazing. Uh, I'm hoping that, you know, it was canceled. So I'm hoping somebody picks it up uh, and continues to tell that story, right? Because it does, I agree, it shows the tensions uh, uh, within Latinx community, shows our perspectives, but it also shows how we mess up too. Mm. And, and I, I think that uh, I really like that, right? Because, mm. you know, we're, we are complex, we're not a monolith, uh, and, and we uh, can mess up and we can exclude people within our community. So I think that it shows that too. Um, one, because it's related to video games here, I, I, uh, and it's released actually in episodes format and it kind of plays out like a TV show. It's called Life is Strange 2. And, you know, in these stories, they're, they're pretty famous for uh, providing queer possibility for, for their characters. And so it's just interesting to see uh, a, Lat a Latino, a Latinx man, uh, perhaps in, uh, be queer in a video game because we often don't get queer men in video games. We often don't see that, right? Um, but it also tells a story through episodes where it's not about winning. It's not about, you know, getting better gear and anything like that. It's about moving the story forward with these two brothers, these Latino brothers, right? And they have to go through you know, being thought of as criminals. There's a whole, there's all these tropes, right? That make it, you know, it's productive and also counterproductive at the same time. But uh, I think it's one that we can also look to for what's possible in video games. Uh, sadly, um, you know, the game was created by two French white men, but it appears that they did their homework and they went around and studied, uh, you know, and took, you know, testimonial from people in the U.S. to see, you know, how immigrant uh, narratives sort of play out here. Uh, and they took inspiration from, uh, from immigration crises in, in Europe as well. So I think that it's valuable in how it positions players to navigate the game sutured together with a Mexican-American, which is almost near impossible in video games. It doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Well, look, I want to thank you both for gifting us here in this space, your incredible insight and your wisdom, your expertise, and also, of course, for your incredible contributions to Latinx TV in the 21st century. Thank you, Irma and Carlos. Thank you. Thank you.